All right. Hi, everybody. If you're joining us, thanks for being here for the GEOI event on songwriting and production. I'm just going to give a short little introduction for our awesome guest that we have here today, and then I'm going to pass the mic over to him. So our guest today is Thavius Beck. He's a multi-instrumentalist, producer, MC, and electronic music educator whose life revolves around music and technology with a focus on bass heavy rhythms, dark emotional melodies, and twisted sample manipulation. He has released numerous albums of his own, both as Thavius Beck and under his previous moniker Adlib and collaborated, collaborated with or remixed artists such as Saul Williams, Nine Inch Nails, The Mars Volta, Skylar Gray, and Nas, just to name a few. His ability to both perform and produce has earned him much recognition in the electronic music community, and we're super happy to have him here. I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to you, Thavius. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me, and I appreciate the introduction. Hello to everybody who has joined the stream. Uh, my name is Thavius Beck. I am a professor at Berkeley NYC. Uh, I've also previously taught at Berkeley in Boston in the undergrad program. And uh, I'm very fond of making music, uh, utilizing any sort of tools at my disposal. Uh, I've been an Ableton Live certified trainer for uh, 13 years now, almost 14 years. Uh, I'm also a Bitwig certified trainer. I use a lot of different hardware. Um, and ultimately it's not necessarily about a certain piece of software or a certain piece of gear. It's really about you having an idea, uh, a desire to express or say something and finding the means to do it. So what I thought would be uh, a fun way to go about this, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, as I said, I'm an Ableton Live certified trainer and in the majority of the classes that I teach, Ableton Live is the main DAW uh, that we end up using. So that's what I have here in front of me. And I have a project that I was working on. Um, the spring semester just started. Uh, I'm currently uh, teaching in the songwriting and production department in Berkeley NYC. Berkeley NYC is a one-year intensive master's program. So the focus is a bit different than what's typically done in undergrad. Uh, in this program, the main focus is for people to build a body of work and to be able to present that body of work um, at the end of the semester. And it should represent who they are as an artist, uh, speak to what they have to say, their artistic sensibilities, and what makes them unique. So a lot of it is exploring how to develop your own sound uh, in different ways to, uh, to make music, all right? So what I have here is a project. Let me go ahead and move over here. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ableton Live, uh, so I'll just approach this as if uh, many of you may not be, all right? Uh, this is a DAW, a digital audio workstation, and in this DAW, I can work with MIDI tracks so I can play virtual instruments. I can also work with audio tracks uh, to bring in recordings uh, and also sample and chop different things up. And I can also uh, time stretch audio in real time so that I can change the pitch without affecting the tempo or change the tempo without affecting the pitch. Because of this, this program is very effective. Uh, for sample manip uh, manipulation, and also for live performance scenarios. Uh, and I've used this a lot for both. But let's kind of step back a bit, all right? In this project, I'll play a little bit of this so you can get a, a bit of context to hear where this developing idea is going. Uh, currently, what I have are a group of drum tracks, and I'll break down how this idea is kind of developed. I have a track with a little simple sub-bass idea. Uh, I have a group of tracks that are melodic ideas, and these are all grouped together so I can get some side chain compression so they duck when the kick plays. And ultimately the thought is that I wanted to make something that was nice and atmospheric, that was moody, and that had instruments and sounds reacting to each other. The idea of using something like side chain compression where we can have one sound duck in volume when another sound plays uh, means that these two sounds are interacting with each other throughout the mix. It also creates this nice kind of pumping sound so that uh, not only is there space for the two sounds to coexist, uh, but it also creates this nice rhythmic movement as well. So anyway, that's kind of an overview of what's happening. I have an arrangement of these different ideas over here, and many of these tracks are grouped together. If I expand these groups, we can see more of what's going on. All right. And again, this is not a completed song. This is an idea in progress. But the idea of taking something from an idea uh, all the way through to completion means that at a certain point, you'll end up in this place, right? In a certain midpoint. Uh, the idea is being developed. You have an, uh, an idea of where you want it to go, but you're not quite sure if it's there yet, 
All right, so I'll play a bit of this. I'm not going to play the whole five minutes, but I'll give you an idea of where we're at and then just kind of break down how I got to this point, uh, discussing some of the techniques I'm using on these different tracks. So here we go. Okay, so that's like a minute or so of this track, right? And this came about because as the spring semester started, uh, the initial concept with students was the idea of working with what we call stems, all right? Right now, these are all tracks. It's a mixture of MIDI tracks, of audio tracks, uh, a lot of this stuff I'm developing in real time. Uh, but the initial idea for this came from a stem uh, that I exported from an older track that I worked on last week. Um, exporting stems is just the process of instead of us exporting all these individual tracks, uh, maybe we might group some of these together based on a certain um, sound type. For example, I have individual tracks here that are all percussive tracks. If I solo this group, let me find a place where they all play. So there's four different tracks that occupy the role of percussion here. And uh, I could have these all as separate files if I was going to export them. But if I want to create a stem, I could simplify this. If I don't need these all to be separate, uh, I could export a stem where all four of these tracks are part of one stereo file. And then that could be my percussion stem. Uh, utilizing stems gives you a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of uh, not worrying about extra CPU requirements if you're using a bunch of MIDI instruments um, or uh, CPU intensive plugins uh, can be helpful if you need to give somebody files to mix your project uh, or to remix your project. But the main way that I like to utilize stems is that it allows me to take an idea from one project that I started on. And if I feel like it's not going where I want, instead of abandoning that idea, I can say, okay, I like this sound. I kind of like how these drums sound. And maybe if I take these sounds and do something different with them, it might lead me in a different direction. What's really cool about this is that throughout doing this process, uh, either resampling, uh, creating stems, exporting sounds that I create from scratch, this process leads me to creating a library of sounds that are very unique to me. Because this process that I'm doing, uh, it's not just about throwing on a preset of an effect. Uh, you know, it's taking the sound and doing multiple steps to get it to sound different. Uh, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about, because one of the initial stems that I worked with, right? And again, the the idea here is that this bigger idea started from something very simple. I took one piece from that very simple idea and decided that I wanted to try something different. So I still have the original project that all this stuff came from, uh, but the vibe here is very, very different from where I started. These are audio clips, and these audio clips are actually from the initial stem that I took uh, and brought over here and used as the basis for this new idea. This is a melodic sound, so I'm going to go ahead and just uh, bring this down here so you can hear it without everything else going on and get an idea of where this all started. So let me go ahead and disable all that. Okay. So just to be clear, like I said, this file here, this audio clip, this is a stem. I exported a group of synth tracks, a group of melodic tracks, uh, where I created some sort of idea, and this came from a different project. I didn't really like the other stuff I added to it, but I really liked the tone of these sounds together. Uh, so let me just play this so you can hear where things started. This isn't warped, nothing's being manipulated, and let me make sure no effects are being applied so you can hear it in its original glory.
So pretty simple. I like the tone of it. Uh, I did a really, really simple melody, but I really like the tone there. The thing is, is that I felt like um, that melody wasn't really going anywhere. And the stuff that I added on top of it didn't really give me um, something that uh, was inspiring. Oh, yes. Is there a question? I heard somebody's mic come on. Okay, maybe that was an accident. <laughs> if there are questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and uh, we'll try to address them uh, sooner or later. Hello? Okay. Uh, but if you can, please keep your mics off. All right. So as far as this stem file, what I ended up doing with this is uh, I created a few different tracks. Let me go ahead and collapse some of this stuff so it's not too overbearing here. Uh, I took this stem and I did a few interesting things with it to play around. Uh, one thing that I did is if we go up here. I took this one clip and I duplicated it numerous times. And with each one of these clips, if we go down here at the bottom of the screen, in Ableton Live, um, all of our ideas are contained in clips. This is an audio file inside of, or I'm sorry, this is an audio track. Inside of our audio track, we have audio clips. And these audio clips can either be... Uh, recordings, samples, loops, any piece of audio. This audio is the stem that I exported from an older uh, project. And each one of these is transposed. So the pitch is a little bit different. All right. And I have this set up so that when I play one of these, it'll trigger the next one after two beats or what is this two? Yeah, two beats after a half note. Okay. I'm utilizing something called follow action in Ableton Live, which allows me to play a clip and then make that clip trigger the next one or any other clip uh, that happens to be next to it. So with this solo, I can give you an idea of what that one stem ended up turning into. All right, so I took that one idea and I ended up making the melody out of it. There's a few different ways I could have approached this. Uh, instead of using follow action and duplicating clips and transposing them, I could have just taken this and put it inside of a MIDI instrument like Sampler or Simpler and played it chromatically. Um, but that's not where my workflow took me, right? There's multiple solutions uh, for things that may or may not be problems. <laughs> so I liked what this ended up doing. Um, and I actually changed this even more once I recorded it. But the point is, is that I started with a simple idea and was able to rethink a different way to implement it. All right. Uh, moving over here, I believe. Oh, in fact, I did do that. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So this is the same file, the same stem. In fact, if I look at this audio clip, we can see how the audio looks. And if I go to this track and we look, this is an instrument called Simpler. Simpler is a MIDI instrument. It allows us to play back samples either chromatically at different pitches, or we can slice the samples up. Now, in this case, I actually did take this stem and I did play it chromatically. Let's go ahead and solo this. And I believe I have a clip here. Okay, now to go from that initial stem to this particular sound is not really that big of a leap, but you can hear there's a lot more personality, much more character. It's way more interesting to me, all right? Now, to break down how we got here, like I said, I just put that stem inside of a MIDI instrument called Simpler. And I realized that uh, I wanted to do some sort of melody, but I didn't just want like a two bar loop. I wanted a progression that was a bit more interesting. So. If we look at my MIDI clip here, all right, this is a MIDI track. I'm using a MIDI instrument. In order to play the MIDI instrument, I need to play MIDI notes and put them in a MIDI clip. So I have notes here that I played. I played a nice little ascending minor melody here. Uh, the notes are very, very short. So the sample decays very quickly. It doesn't sustain. Uh, but the biggest thing that I did is I also utilized a MIDI effect so that instead of playing these same notes every four bars, It'll play these for four bars. The next four bars, it actually uh, shifts all the notes up one semitone. I did this by using some automation. And in Ableton Live, we can automate things within a clip. 
all right? In this case, this is called a clip envelope, all right? In musical terms, an envelope allows you to change things over time. And generally, uh, you find envelopes in synthesizers, all right? You might have an amplitude envelope, a filter envelope. So every time you play a note, uh, the amplitude or the filter cutoff changes. In this case, the clip envelope is there so that every time we play a clip, certain parameters can be automated or modulated. In this case, what I did to make my simple idea even more fancy is I added a MIDI effect, all right? Most DAWs will have audio effects uh, as well as MIDI effects. With audio effects, it's gonna process the audio that comes out of our instrument or our audio clips. With MIDI effects, we can process the MIDI notes before they actually hit the MIDI instrument. So I didn't have to change the notes in the clip. I didn't have to extend it. All I had to do was create some automation on this MIDI effect. This will take the notes that come out of my clip and it will process them before it hits this instrument. So what I did is I just automated this pitch MIDI effect. If I go to MIDI effects here, there's a MIDI effect called pitch. And I can just take the incoming notes and just shift them by a number of semitones. So if I play the clip again, if you look at the automation that's happening there, you'll notice after four bars, it just goes up a semitone. I think it also goes up two semitones at the very end of the bar. You'll see. Okay. Now, before I move on from this sound, uh, it's obviously quite affected. And there's a handful of effects on here that are adding some very nice character and texture to the sound. But I want to deactivate all of these, and then we'll activate them one by one to really hear what's going on. We got our nice modulators here, too. I'll break that down as well. Okay, so let's deactivate this entire chain. Let me collapse the browser. All right, so the same stem, the same sound being played chromatically through Simpler. The automation with the MIDI effect will happen, but all the audio effects are going to be off. So what does this sound like with no processing? Oh, let's also turn down. I'll just mute the sends, the returns. Here we go. Okay, that's a very different, uh, not quite as interesting sort of texture. So again, in order to take this same sound and make it sound very different for a different part of my song, uh, I wanted to process it differently, all right? These notes are playing in a higher octave, so already it sounds a bit different. Uh, I'm only playing the very beginning of the stem, so that gives it a different sort of uh, context in the song. Uh, but I also wanted this to sound a bit more glitchy and kind of weird and atmospheric and sort of swirly and stuff like that, right? So another thing when you're thinking about writing a song, you're thinking about production, uh, there's things you're going to place in the song because you like them in terms of the melody or in terms of the rhythm. It's also a good idea to think in terms of atmosphere and environment, uh, in terms of width, uh, how the song sort of like envelops your listener, Um different things like that, because it makes a big difference in terms of the song sounding more uh, professional, more polished, more engrossing, uh, and just easier for a listener to get lost into. Width is a big deal, right? So when it comes to playing around with panning and things moving around, uh, it can be nice to do that, especially with higher frequency elements. So uh, what I did first, I wanted to address the glitchy thing first. Ableton Live has this effect called beat repeat, which is like a classic Ableton Live effect. The audio comes in and you can make the audio repeat a certain number of times per bar or per half note or whatever you want. Um, if you understand how to manipulate this, it can be very useful to get like some cool glitch rhythm based effects. Uh, but if you just turn it on and use a preset, uh, it'll sound, I don't want to say generic, but it might sound a bit obvious. Let's put it that way. So. Let me play the stem again. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm mixing uh, what beat repeat does. So it's going to take the first, what is this, the first 16th note, and it's going to make it repeat uh, seven additional times. All right. It's not going to always do this. There's a chance knob here. So there's a certain probability that it will or will not do that. Uh, the audio that repeats will be an octave lower than the notes that are coming in. 
the volume will be a little bit lower and it'll slightly decay as the notes repeat. Uh, and there's a chance that the beat repeat grid, it's set to 16th notes. So every note will repeat every 16th note. There's also a variation knob here so that it won't always be every 16th note, all right? So the whole thing is there's enough happening here to give us a sense of randomization. Uh, and this will be blended in with the original signal. So let me play this uh, without beat repeat and then I'll activate it so you can hear what this adds in terms of character to the sound. Seem like it's less than 50% now, but anyway, you can hear every so often we get that little glitchy thing happening. So I thought that's cool, but that still sounds too predictable and a little bit too dry. So what could I do to kind of mask this? All right. At this point, I started thinking about uh, not just stereo width, but also what could make this sound a little bit more, um, let's say like smeared, a little bit more kind of gauzy, maybe not as clearly in focus. Um, oftentimes when I think about music, there's a lot of visual terms I'll use, uh, because to me, music is very visual. When I listen to something, I close my eyes and I can just instantly see things related to what I'm hearing, right? So, uh, in terms of what I'd like to see when I hear this sound, uh, I'm thinking something that has a softer, less focused, more gauzy kind of feel. Uh, and I thought a cool way to do that would be to utilize some delay. Uh, but... I wanted to approach this, like I said, and also think about making it a bit more glitchy. So Ableton Live has an effect called a grain delay. And um, if you don't know about uh, granular synthesis or what a grain is in terms of uh, working with audio, it's not really that difficult of an idea. Basically a grain would be like a, a very, very tiny piece of audio, okay? Uh, there's an instrument in Ableton Live, it's a Max for Live device called the granulator. Uh, Max Instruments uh, granulator. And if you have Ableton Live Suite, uh, I believe the granulator is included. If not, you can just download it. Uh, it's one of the free packs. There it is. Uh, with the granulator, you can throw samples in there uh, and you can adjust the grain size and the grain size will adjust the size of the loop that plays. All right, so you can think of a grain as a very, very small loop. With the grain delay, when I activate this, uh, I have this set up so that uh, the audio that comes in uh, is going to be delayed in small grains. So it's not going to be like a quarter note delay. And it's going to do something really interesting to the sound of the audio. Um, but I wasn't done there. So let's just hear what grain delay adds. And then I'll break down what's going on with this modulation. The whole point here is to just talk about how you can take a very simple idea. And if you're open to... Uh, not letting it be too precious, playing around exploration might allow you to take that simple idea in a totally different direction that might be more fruitful than where you were going initially. All right. So anyway, let's hear what this sounds like going through grain delay, and then we'll talk about some modulation. Okay, now right now it sounds a little bit odd because uh, this is set up where I have two different parameters. We have like this little black rectangle here. This is essentially an X, Y grid. And we can select one parameter over here, all right, for the Y axis and a parameter down here for the X axis. Currently spray uh, is what's being adjusted vertically. And this is kind of like the size of the grains uh, as the audio is being delayed. Down here, we have pitch. So we can adjust the pitch of the grains as the audio is delayed. I was grabbing this, trying to move it and realized I can't move it because I have both of these parameters being controlled by something else, all right? I mentioned before the idea of automation or using a clip envelope. And I did that to automate this MIDI effect over here, all right? So every time I play this clip, uh, the uh, pitch parameter will change. I wanted to do something similar for the grain delay, but I didn't want to do automation. And I didn't want the uh, changes to these parameters to be the same every time. So instead, I grabbed some modulators. 
all right? When we talk about modulation, we're just changing things over time. And an LFO, a low frequency oscillator, this is a really common form of modulation. This is another thing you see typically in a synthesizer. In Ableton Live, if I go into my audio effects, uh, we have a few modulators we can use to modulate other parameters, to change the value of those parameters. And here's the LFO device. So this is what I grabbed. And if I activate this first one, all right, now that this is on, I can see with the grain delay, this little circle is moving left and right. And what that means is that the pitch parameter, okay, is being affected because that's what's being selected for the X axis. The LFO here is mapped to the pitch parameter. And all I have to do to map this, just to show you, let's go ahead and grab this again. There it is. When it's not mapped, there's a button that says map, and I can just press this and click on any parameter on any device on any track, and it will follow the shape of the LFO, right, of the waveform being generated here. Okay. So I use two LFOs to modulate these two different parameters so that when the sound plays, it will be more interesting. So let me play it again, and then I'll activate the LFO so you can hear uh, what the grain delay is really supposed to do. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So I thought this was cool. This is making it more glitchy. It's not giving me the gauzy, hazy, less focused kind of thing, right? And especially with uh, this being such kind of, um, it sounds kind of obvious, I guess, that it's going through these effects. Uh, so again, just kind of like, yeah, just making it a little bit more sort of fuzzy, less focused. Yeah. Uh, I thought using the Echo device, okay, uh, this is an Ableton Live, uh, it's a delay device, but it's more like a space echo. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the old Roland space echo, uh, or just like a vintage tape echo, uh, device, but this works in a similar way. Um, in terms of adding character, uh, you can get the feedback to be pretty fuzzy. Uh, you can add some, uh, warbling to it. So it sounds like a worn out tape. It's just a really cool effect in terms of adding character. And I'm really big on character. Uh, because part of what makes your songs interesting is the fact that the sounds sound like you, right? You think about your favorite artists, there's probably a certain sound uh, that you can associate with them, right? So anyway, with all that said, uh, I'll activate the echo device. You'll hear what this is adding. And then in addition to that, I'm sending it to reverb and echo uh, that I have on these returns. So I'm doing all this to take that one sound and make it sound distinctly different. And uh, let's see where we actually ended up. Okay, so that's more what I wanted. And I really, really liked where that ended up because the combination of the movement here, uh, the sound of the echo, a uh, little bit of additional reverb here just to kind of put it in a certain space, make it feel like it's occurring in some sort of like bigger room. Uh, all of that works pretty well, all right? And a big part of this was the idea of me not treating the original idea that I started with, which was a totally different project not feeling like that was too precious or something that I had to like, you know, fight to like work all the way through to get done. Sometimes it's good to know like, okay, let me just give this project a rest. Maybe I want to start on a different idea. Maybe I want to go outside and get some sunshine and come back. Um, but approaching it with the right sort of um, inspiration and the right sort of like uh, playful exploration. You know, I think those two things are really, really important. And uh, that's a big part of what this is about, all right? So let me talk through a little bit more of this and uh, in a bit we will stop. And if there's any questions, uh, we will address those. Let me just make sure I'm not uh, missing anything. Okay. All right. So in terms of melodic ideas, pretty much all of these melodic ideas came from that one sound. 
All right. Uh, in addition to that, let's go over here uh, to my drums. All right. I was talking about the, oh, you know what? Let me make sure I didn't leave something soloed. Okay, I did. All right. So as far as the drums go, uh, the initial idea that I started with, uh, there was a kick and snare pattern um, that I liked. It was okay. It was fine. Uh, it was more just kind of like a placeholder for me to do some other stuff with. Um, but ultimately, having that there, having the rhythm there inspired me to uh, try to play around with some percussive, percussive sounds in an interesting way. All right. I really like playing around with rhythmic stuff. Uh, I love the idea of slicing things and chopping them up. And I feel like anything can be percussive or rhythmic if you just treat it like a percussive or rhythmic sound. All right. So here's an example. Let's focus on the drums. Let me solo this. All right. The initial drum beat, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was just these two. And oh, you know what? Hold on a second. Let's do that and that and unmute that. And I don't even know if the sound's still playing in here. Let me find a proper part of the song. Okay. Now, with this drum beat, I might as well just go ahead and kind of break down a little bit about this as well, because... There's some interesting stuff going on here, especially in terms of songwriting in Ableton Live. Uh, the drum beat that I'm using is a two bar loop, but I didn't want it to just seem like a two bar loop. So I did a couple of things to give this a bit more variation as it plays throughout the arrangement. Uh, one thing that I really appreciate in Ableton Live 11 is that there's now a uh, probability. So when you're entering MIDI notes, uh, the MIDI notes don't have to play 100% of the time. We look at the bottom of my MIDI clip. We have the velocity of the notes. And then I also have this area here. Uh, if it's not visible, I can just click this button. And then I can change the probability, the chance that notes will play. So the basic drum beat is just boom, 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 boom. But then I added a few extra kicks here that aren't going to play that often uh, that can kind of spice the rhythm up a little bit, all right? So that's why the drumbeat has a bit of variation. And uh, that's why it doesn't bore me to tears <laughs> every time I hear it. But something about this kick pattern, I just wasn't really as into. So what I ended up doing before I figured out what I wanted to do with the drums, I realized that I liked the, yeah, that's why this is muted. I realized that I liked this, this little snare hat thing. Later on, there's a part where the hi-hats play. All right. Um, and I like that. I just wasn't in love with the sound of the kick. So I ended up recording some other drums to go along with this snare hat thing. And I recorded these from uh, a piece of hardware, from a hardware sampler that I have. Uh, it's the SP404 Mark II. The whole point is that having that other uh, device, there's pads on it. It feels really good to play. It's very tactile. It feels more like an instrument. So playing the drums out in real time feels a lot more natural to me. And once I did that, I got a drum beat that I liked a lot more versus just programming the kick pattern the way I did over here. So once I play these two together, then I can talk about kind of how I approach this percussion stuff. Um, and again, a lot of this is the idea of trying to combine um, previous ideas that I might have done in the box with uh, audio from different places, right? And just finding different ways to approach making it sound interesting uh, in the context of making a song. So, all right, here's the snare hat thing. Uh, the additional drums, let me make sure. Yes, they play here. Let's just loop this section. All right, so. All right, so I like how those work together. Um, after I've realized that I like that combination, uh, I decided that, uh, to help this snare hat clip not sound like just a very static kind of loop, uh, that I want to add some automation so that every, what is this, eight bars? Yeah, every eight bars, the last snare of the eighth bar gets sent to, uh, echo. All right, so that's why I get that nice little echo there. 
so again just doing stuff to like give these smaller ideas um yeah more room to not sound so repetitive that that's really the biggest kind of motivation behind this is starting off with smaller loops and then finding out how to make these loops not feel so much like loops right so that's where uh some of this percussive stuff came into play so let me unsolo all this and i guess i could simply this is one thing that's nice about grouping things you can just mute the groups okay let's do that all right so there are these four drum tracks uh this original kick is muted so these are the three that that are here that are active and then all their percussion all right if i solo their percussion uh, the way that I layered this, all of these sounds here are not actually percussive sounds. Um, and you might be able to tell by the names of the tracks. <laughs> uh, this first one here, um, I initially had the plain drums from the drum kit. I hadn't recorded the live drums from the 404 yet. And I felt like they sounded too much like a preset stock kit. Again, I wanted to try to find a way to add some character, add something that didn't sound like it was so in the box. I was sitting here with my laptop, I was in my kitchen, and there was like a plastic bag with some, I don't know if there's like almonds or pumpkin seeds or whatever, right? But there was a plastic bag that was pretty loud and crunchy. And I just started squeezing it and messing with it. And I realized I had a built-in mic on my computer. Let me just record the plastic bag and see what happens. So I ended up recording that. And the result is, is this going through a bunch of stuff? Okay, no, it's just EQ. So I don't even re remember what this sounds like on its own. Okay. The process of getting there involves some creative warping in Ableton Live. All right. The original recording, do I have, is it here? It's fine. Let me just duplicate this clip and let me transpose this back. And then we should be able to hear what this sounded like uh, properly. All right. So let me play the clip now. It's funny too, because this reminds me that there's a bunch of stuff at the end of this that I could use for a totally different project. But anyway, I wanted to use this as some sort of rhythmic percussive thing to complement the drums. And anything that happens in a regular interval can be rhythmic, right? If something loops every bar, no matter what the rhythm within that bar sounds like, if it's consistently doing that every single bar, uh, there's a certain consistent rhythm to that, right? And you can use that to your advantage. So I loop this for a bar and it sounds like. Okay, that's not inherently very rhythmic, right? But I realized that with Ableton Live, if I transpose this, uh, there's some fun things I can do as a consequence of how Ableton Live treats warped audio. If I transpose this up higher, it'll increase the pitch. Uh, but it's not going to change the duration. So it's not going to play back more quickly, right? It's going to time stretch the audio. And depending on how we warp this, uh, we can get uh, the audio to play back in some interesting ways. All right. So as an example, the default way Ableton Live will warp the audio is something like this. All right. And this means that it's going to preserve the timing of basically the loudest volume spikes, okay, wherever the audio peaks, the transients. Let me play this right now, and I'm going to transpose it up an octave, and let's see what it sounds like. Okay, that still doesn't sound very rhythmic to me, all right? It's definitely glitchy, but not that rhythmic. So I decided that I wanted Ableton Live to basically play this back uh, or make sure the timing of this is accurate every 16th note. So no matter how much I change the pitch, make sure that you preserve the timing of the audio every 16th note, all right? And below this, there's an option that determines basically what happens in between the transients or whatever this preserve setting is, um, depending on how you stretch the audio, right? If I increase the pitch, uh, each little segment is shorter and it's gotta do something to tie these pieces together so it sounds like the audio is playing continuously. Uh, Ableton Live creates little loops between in this case, every 16th note to make the audio sound like it's playing continuously. But 
but I didn't want that. I actually wanted to sound like the audio was being cut every 16th note. So it gives me something a bit more rhythmic. So I just went to this option down here. And instead of having the audio loop between the 16th notes, I said, don't loop between the 16th notes. Now at the regular pitch, this wouldn't make a difference. But as I increase the pitch, what Ableton Live is doing is it's basically splitting the audio into 16th notes. And it's making sure each 16th note will play where the next 16th note is supposed to start. If I'm increasing the pitch, the duration of each one of these segments should get shorter and Ableton Live would need to do something to fill in those gaps. And I'm saying, don't fill in the gaps, just cut it, make it feel like it's being cut every 16th note. And this turns my little plastic bag slice sample into something that feels a lot more rhythmic. Okay, so that's one percussive element there. If I go over to this track, uh, it's Floor Vox. <laughs> uh this came from the sp404 as well yeah uh where is it at i put it away um the sp404 is this hardware sampler it's got a ton of effects um and i love playing around with it mainly because if you connect it to your computer via usb you can stream all the audio via usb and run all that audio through the effects on the 404 and I'm the kind of person, I like basketball and I like boxing. Those are two sports that I watch. So I'll sit here and I might be messing around with music and just have a game on on my computer uh, and stream the audio through the 404 and just run it through effects and maybe just grab some sounds to see what happens. This is, I think, audio that I captured during some basketball game. Um, and I just messed with it and it became something interesting. So I don't remember how this sounds out of context, but let's just check it out. Is this? Oh, yeah, that is it. Okay. Oh, that's right, because it's two different samples. So let me go ahead and play it from over here. What track is that? It is this track here, because I think it's two different clips that play back to back. Let's go here. And yeah. All right. So let's do this. And let me zoom in a bit so we can see what's really going on. All right. <laughs> All right, that's not meant to be like one of the main percussive sounds, but it's in there to add yet another kind of glitchy sort of texture. For the effects with this, that was done with hardware and in real time, and I just recorded this stuff. And again, just alternated between a clip that was an octave lower and slower and one that was an octave higher and more glitched out. So the fact that these alternate every bar, and there's a pretty consistent rhythm in there. The ones that are an octave higher, again, are more glitchy. Sometimes the rhythm kind of goes a little wonky, uh, but there's a consistent pattern every bar, right? So it still feels rhythmic. Um, and it's buried behind a bunch of other stuff that's more obvious in terms of its rhythm, all right? So again, taking simple pieces and trying to add some character, trying to find a unique way to combine these things. So I don't just have a bunch of preset stock drums uh, to anchor a bunch of preset stock synths, right? I want this to sound more like me. Going further into the percussion, and hopefully I'm not boring all of you, but uh, I find manipulating audio fascinating. So <laughs> uh, this sound came from a generic vocal sample um, maybe I shouldn't say generic. It was a stock vocal sample that's in Ableton Live's library. I just went into the browser, went into samples, and probably just typed in Vox or voice or something. In fact, it might even be, yeah, whatever. This is something that uh, everyone who has Ableton Live has this sample. And if I, I guess I want to play this as it normally is first. So let me just deactivate the arpeggiator. Set this to classic and I will on the track and let me play this. Okay, so that's the vocal sample. I don't know if that's an octave too high, but that's the sample. 
And I didn't care about what the vocal said at all. All I wanted to do was just grab something that I could slice into smaller segments uh, and then have those smaller segments play rhythmically. All right. Again, I'm doing this to add some percussion. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's a voice. There's an interesting texture to the sound. With this, I used another MIDI effect. All right. In this case, I used the arpeggiator MIDI effect. Uh, when you uh, are doing an arpeggio, instead of holding down notes for a chord, you would play them one after the other in some sort of rhythmic interval. This arpeggiator MIDI device will do that for you, basically. If you hold down any notes, it'll repeat those notes instead of sustaining them. And I use this. I opened up the browser so I could show it. There's the arpeggiator. All right. Uh, I used this so that I could have some fun playing around with the rhythm of this clip. All right, here I did automation. And if we look at the automation for this track, uh, did I actually automate this? Yes, I did. At a certain point, I made this go faster. I think that might've been an accident. <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. Okay, no, I did. Yeah, for this segment, it goes slower. All right, so just some minor automation. But the whole point is that if we look at the actual clip, each one of these is just sustaining a single note for a full bar. So what's the result? So the whole reason for the arpeggiator is because without this, what would happen is it would just play the one slice. And that wouldn't be fun. So I turn this on. This is going to play uh, this note and repeat it every 16th note. But I didn't just want to repeat the first slice. So I might as well go ahead and explain this as well. Uh, if the arpeggiator was just on with his default settings, it would have done this. And to me, that's a little annoying. So I wanted some variety. And with this arpeggiator device, we can make it so that when it plays a note, the next note that gets played can be a certain distance from the note that just played, all right? So I wanted to make it so that every subsequent note was two semitones higher than the previous one. All right, so where it says distance, I'm gonna change that to plus two, all right? How many times do I want it to jump this distance? All right, that's what the steps knob is here for. So basically I want it to go up two semitones, a maximum of four times. Play the first note, jump up two, jump up two, jump up two, and then go back to the first note. So with this setup, now I get a nice little pattern here. And I like that, okay? And the fact that I'm using a MIDI effect to do this means that I can easily automate or change these parameters to get a different rhythm, to have this go a different number of steps, et cetera, all right? So it gives me flexibility in terms of changing the arrangement, adding more character, uh, and making the song go where I want, okay? So all of those elements were uh, added to the percussion. Uh, let me just go here as well. And I guess to kind of bring this full circle, uh, and then we'll wrap up very shortly. Uh, I wanted to make sure that um, even though I did all this fun stuff with the percussion and the drums, I can't just have that going the entire time through the arrangement because then it would still feel like a loop. It wouldn't feel dynamic. It wouldn't feel like a song, right? Um, so I took the sample from here with all the, arpeggi uh, the arpeggiating goodness and uh, I duplicated the track. We can see that there's two of these. On this track, I... Uh, froze and flattened the track, which means that I took the MIDI instrument um, and all the audio coming from here, we basically committed this to audio. So this track is now an audio track. There are no MIDI instruments or MIDI effects. It's all just audio. I did that so I could take advantage of warping the audio. And what did I do here? Did I reverse this? Let me see what I actually did. Ah, uh, right. I'd have to step back to even show that. But yeah, I duplicated this track. I froze and flattened it so it would be audio. And the main reason I did that was so that I could transpose the audio down an octave, but also so that I could do something like this. I could take the audio and split it. And let's say maybe I split just this part. And then I could take that and I could copy and paste it somewhere else. 
I could duplicate it. I could reverse it. I could do whatever I want. So I was able to take a small piece of, there we go, of the original sample from here and just copy and paste it and create a different rhythm down here. So again, trying to get as much as possible from one sound or from a small collection of sounds, uh, to me is really fun because it kind of like, it sort of gamifies the song making process. It gives me more motivation. Uh, it gives me different goals to try to shoot for. And oftentimes that'll lead me down a path where I end up with sounds um, that are even more interesting than what I was trying to like, you know, achieve uh, consciously, right? I might have an idea initially that makes me start out wanting to make something, but by playing around and just exploring and kind of like letting the creative process guide me, uh, oftentimes I end up with stuff that's a lot cooler than the initial idea that I was thinking about. So that's really the whole um, thought process behind this uh, sort of rambling <laughs> presentation here is that the songwriting process, the production process, there's really no right or wrong way to approach it as long as you're doing it with the right sort of inspiration uh, the right sort of motivation and drive, and uh, with something to say and express, you know, in this case, you know, even if it's an instrumental track, which this currently is, uh, the idea is that I wanted to create a mood, I want to create an atmosphere, uh, I want to create some sort of vibe, I want people to feel a certain way when they hear this, right, and I want to feel a certain way when I hear it, so that's kind of my motivation, you know, uh, not too dark, not too aggressive, uh, somewhat soothing, but a journey, you know, uh, contemplative, atmospheric, something you can kind of get lost in. Um, so those are kind of the guiding principles behind the decisions that I'm making. And it's not even like I'm thinking about that consciously, but ultimately I am, right? <laughs> because I know what direction I wanna take this, even if I don't know what the final picture looks like. So, um, so with all that said, to sum up, what I would say is um, as you're thinking about, you know, the songwriting process, the creation process, I think it's really important to uh, not focus so much on what you think people want to hear or what the outside expectations might be. Uh, it's important to focus on what you want to express, what you feel you have to say, what you feel you can contribute to the greater pantheon of music, um, and have fun and explore different ways to get there. You know, um, I think the big thing is that most people get into wanting to make music because they heard something that inspired them. And whatever that thing was that inspired them might have been completely new and different and foreign and something you didn't expect, right? So I like the idea of helping people create that, something new and different and coming from you, right? The totality of your own inspiration, your own experience, uh, and putting that into your music. So, so with that said, just, you know, have fun with the process. Don't be afraid to take something and reimagine it, rework it, tweak it. Um, because uh, the results might be very fruitful. So um, so that's my spiel. And I think that we, yeah, we're doing good on time here. So uh, let me go ahead and open up my little chat window and look at the participants. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions or if anyone had any, um, yeah, things they'd like to know, things they'd like to follow up with. Uh, I think now would be a good time to kind of open up the floor because I'm basically done. <laughs> Hopefully all of you got something useful out of that. Uh, are folks still here? I see names in the participant list. Feel free to say hello. Yeah, everyone, if you have any questions for Thavius, please put those in the chat or um, just unmute yourself too, it's fine. Or any comments or anything like that. Yeah, Thavius, hi. Hello. Yeah, that, was, that, was a, that was interesting, thank you. Um, you talked about uh, how you see things when you compose. When mm -hmm. you, um, I'm interested about this. Could you say more about it? Um, well, yeah. I mean, when I first started really getting into music, uh, initially, I started off playing the alto saxophone and the tenor sax and uh, was really into uh, music that was like a bit more prog rock and like jazz fusion was really what I was into. And a lot of that started from a particular album uh, from this artist named Lenny White. It was called The Adventures of Astro Pirates. Uh, I remember my mom had that record sitting in the house and she would play it a lot. The whole thing with this record is that it was a double gatefold vinyl, right? And hand-drawn art. And it was about these people who were like, you know, traveling throughout the universe, uh, spreading love through music. And when you open it up, 
each chapter, each song is like a chapter in the story. And it's beautifully drawn. It like, you know, um, it was a really, really big inspiration for me as a kid. I remember first hearing this record when I was like five. Um, so the point is, is that like, for me, maybe that kind of like created the framework for it. Um, but when I hear things, I really think in terms of just like colors, in terms of feeling, in terms of like what that would look like or what that sound would fit in terms of a visual, you know? Um, later on, as I started making more of my own music, a lot of people would tell me, you know, this sounds really cinematic. This would be really good for visual media. Um, and as a hobby, I, I, you know, have cameras and I shoot video and I do my own little editing projects and whatnot. So uh, the idea of like marrying sound to a visual to enhance or to play with or to change the mood uh, is really, really powerful, you know? So at this point now, when I hear stuff, there's just instantly a picture that comes into my head, whether it's like, okay, this feels relaxing. So I can picture like a beach or a relaxing, you know, scenario, or this feels like there's intense momentum. So I can picture like a dark corridor and somebody running, right? Or this feels like, uh, you know, someone is about to like embark on the next chapter. So it feels like, uh, you know, maybe the light's about to fade, uh, you know, maybe like fade to black, but as it's fading to black, like there's like a, a, a ray of light that's shooting into the scene, you know, letting you know that things are about to get better. So this kind of visual imagery to me, um, it's just, it's just something that happens, you know? Um, but for me, it's really good because I feel like, you know, music is something where you can't always communicate these ideas in words right so the more ways that you can find to express or communicate these ideas the easier it is to get people to understand what you're talking about you know so sometimes a musical term might not make sense but to say like okay this feels warm someone will know what that means this feels like the color blue right this feels like dark and rough you know those terms might translate better than being more technical so that's kind of a roundabout answer but ultimately that's really what it is you know yeah, nice. And like, if you play, uh, I don't know, uh, all the things you are on the saxophone, what, what would you, what would you see? What would you picture in your head? Um, I mean, it depends, you know, for, for me, like, you know, I love things that are uh, minor, uh, darker, um, not dark in terms of like, you know, depressing or sad or like uh, meant to bring you down, but just in terms of like contemplative, um, insightful, um, somewhat challenging again not challenging in terms of the music being difficult but more about like looking inward you know um things that feel like that or like feel like they can kind of take you to that place um that's really like what i'm most interested in um so yeah so uh again like we're playing the saxophone and whatnot a lot of what i was into it wasn't even necessarily saxophone players but just the idea of like a certain era Jean-Luc Ponty, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with, with Jean-Luc Ponty. Uh, as an artist, as a jazz musician, what he was doing was probably like the biggest influence for me. Uh, let's say like in the mid to late seventies and early eighties, there's an album that he did called Cosmic Messenger. And that was another one that my mom had uh, and would play all the time. And that record was a massive influence for me. It came out the year I was born actually, 1979. Um, so if you listen to that record, it's, you can find that it's on YouTube and stuff. If you check that out, like the title song specifically, it's the first song on that album. Um, the vibe of that, I think, really influenced sort of what I wanted to create sonically and also kind of the pictures I wanted to paint, you know? So um, I don't know if that actually answers the question, but... <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm going to check this out. Yeah, no worries. No, th thank you for, for speaking up and uh, I appreciate your contribution. Thank you. And do you think it can, like, is there any, uh, uh, do you feel that it sometimes helps you, like, memorize a song or you have a, a, an example, maybe, or a song where you were, I don't know, maybe having trouble to learn and maybe help having a visual, vi visualizing the song maybe helps you to, to memorize it? Well, you know, it's interesting because, um, well, actually, you know what, now that you say that, yeah, um, I would say, um, and again, this is like early and like, you know, let's say like jazz band in junior high and like high school, stuff like that, right? Um, being able to sort of visualize, if you have a piece of sheet music, um, and kind of visualizing just the distance between the notes, you know, almost being able to see it sort of like a, a, 
like a like a like a skyline of a city you know like a silhouette of downtown or something and you can see like you know certain buildings are higher or lower and there's a bigger jumper distance right some things are closer and, and, and more kind of like you know densely bunched together uh those would be notes that are closer together and maybe played more rapidly you know um it depends i mean uh, i'm sorry you're talking about intervals or uh, rhythm distance distance um, well, I'm talking about intervals, but not specific intervals, just more like an, an overall idea of like the distance, you know, because um, honestly, like in terms of visualization, it, it hasn't really helped in terms of like specifically memorizing a song like that. But in terms of having an idea of, uh, here's a better way to put it, a lot of my um, initial start playing saxophone, uh, specifically like in school and whatnot, at a certain point, I was, you know, considered, I guess, the best saxophone player in, in the school, and I got like a lot of chances to solo and improvise. So a lot of what I'm thinking about is more about like kind of visualizing how what I'm going to do fits into the framework of what everybody else is playing behind me, you know, and having that space to kind of get in and get out. Um, to me, a lot of like what I would see or feel um, what happened more in those moments. And it wasn't so much about like, you know, memorizing a specific phrase or passage, uh, but just having a sense of like, the energy, right? The energy in the room, the energy of the other musicians, and kind of how to fit in with that. It's hard to describe, but it's like, um, it's visualizing like the group as a whole, and seeing sort of like where you are in that landscape, you know. Um, it, it's hard to put in the words, because it's not always the same, you know, it might be something, uh, like I said, where like, you know, the, the idea is like, there's uh, a sense of colors and mood, right? And being able to match or complement the colors of the other people in the room. Or there's a sense of like distance in terms of like uh, frequency, right? Um, balancing the frequency range by playing notes in a higher register or, you know, playing intervals um, that are more interesting or it, 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 it depends on the context, you know? Um, but honestly, like I haven't thought about music in that sense in a while because most of what I've been doing for the past 15, 20 years is either producing in the box or working with other artists using electronic means, right? Uh, and in that case, I'm in control of every single aspect of the music. Um, and then visually it comes across a bit different, you know? So I don't know like if that really sort of clarifies or helps at all, but um, it depends, you know? It's not so much like a synesthesia thing. It's just more about like, these things sound like something that I can visualize. And that visual helps me to, to process the ideas, you know, uh, to put them in a certain context and a framework and, and do something useful with them, you know, so. All right. And how, how did you jump from the saxophone to uh, electronic music? Um, well, when I grew up in Minneapolis and in the fourth grade, all the students were able to join the concert band to, and get an instrument and keep it for the rest of the year. So that's when I first started playing alto saxophone. But at that point I was already like really, really into hip hop. Um, and, I, you know, I guess you could say electronic music for the time, you know, there was artists, a big thing about like some of the progressive jazz that I like where there was a lot of artists using synthesizers, you know, and going in a much more electronic direction with that. Uh, and then also too, some of the pop music in the early eighties, you know, you had a lot more drum machines and whatnot coming into play. Um, but the actual moment that I really started getting into making it myself, uh, there was this arts camp that happened at a college in, uh, Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, yeah, it was at the college in Moore, Moorhead. Yeah. And, um, it was for kids that were like 12 or 13 and it was a creative arts camp. They had five different uh, divisions. So there was like, you know, visual arts, there was theater, there was, uh, you know, music, and there was a couple other ones. So it was a two week intensive program and you go there and the whole idea is that if you're in the music program, you get to collaborate with the other folks in the music program, you get access to the studio uh, and to all the gear they have and you have to write a song from scratch, record it, mix it and present it at the end of the two weeks, right? And we're all like 12, you know, so. Um, when I went into their studio, uh, this must have been with like 91, 1991, uh, they had a sampler there called the Roland S50. And they also had a sequencer connected to it, which was the uh, Insonic SQ2. And those two things together, that was my first time ever like having access 
to electronic music equipment. And I never looked back, you know, I did that program. I ended up writing a song uh, that very closely mimicked <laughs> that Jean-Luc Ponty song I was talking about, Cosmic Messenger, because I was so heavily influenced by him. Um, and then, yeah, after the camp was over, um, through serendipity, uh, we happened to see that same sampler at some pawn shop, me and my mom, and I just begged her to get it for me. And she got it, you know, she, she saw that I was really like into this uh, whole music thing. And, um, and that was really the beginning of it. Then at that point, I started like really exploring techniques for sampling and chopping up stuff and manipulating sounds. Um, it just got deeper and deeper into that rabbit hole, so. Nice, nice story. <laughs> yeah, it's it's what all the journey. It wasn't so much on computers, it was like sequencers and. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It It's interesting because, you know, um, I'm at a point now, you know, it, it's not something, I, I don't bring up age and whatnot to like, you know, um, I don't know. Sometimes people harp on age too much, right? And generational differences. I don't like to do that. We're all people, we're all making music. But in terms of the tools that people grow up with, it changes their whole framework in terms of like what they should expect, you know? Um, the sampler that I'm talking about, the Roland S50, it was a 61 key keyboard that took, you know, uh, floppy disks, right? And it had a total of 14 seconds of sampling time at, what was it? Was it 30? 30 kilohertz? I think it was 30 kilohertz. And you could double the sample rate, uh, double the sampling time if you cut the sample rate in half. There was no sequencing. You could only store a limited amount of samples. And you had to be very creative if you were trying to do anything with just that one machine. But that was like what was, that was the technology of the time. That was what I had access to. So it never felt like a limitation. And it forced me to find creative ways to play around, you know? And ultimately, that kind of mindset is sort of like what's behind me doing a workshop like this, you know, instead of adding countless third party VSTs and having a thousand tracks of all these presets, let me just see what I can do with the sounds I've already made, right? Um, I feel it's more creative. It doesn't lead down this rabbit hole of constant scrolling. Um, and it forces me to be more engaged with the creative side of my brain, you know, so, um, but all of that comes from me needing to work with a lot of old and, you know, antiquated based on today's standards, uh, you know, older gear. You know, if I put a lot of this stuff in front of people now, they'd be quite frustrated trying to make something work. And, you know, that's just what we used all the time. So um, having a DAW is an absolute luxury, quite honestly. And um, I just hope all of you uh, can appreciate, you know, all the numerous tools you have access to. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy, <laughs> quite honestly. So do you feel it's important for us to, like, know about these old tools to use better the modern tools or uh well it's a really good question and i'll put it to you like this uh i don't think everyone needs to be uh you know a, a gear historian necessarily but i do think it's it's important to appreciate um what went into making the things that you really appreciate and like you know um if you're into electronic music uh, you might be surprised to learn what like, you know, some classic songs were made with and some of the limitations that were used, uh, you know, in those studio sessions or in the recording uh, process. To me, I think the big thing is just appreciating working within limitations, right? And whether those are self-imposed limitations or limitations that are imposed by the gear that you have, um, if you have endless options, that's not the best way to foster creativity, you know? Um, especially if you don't have an idea of what you want to do and you're kind of letting those endless options dictate your process. You know, I mentioned before, like the idea of letting the creative process kind of guide you. But if that creative process involves like scrolling through 10,000 presets before you can start, then it, it, it inhibits, you know, your, your, the amount of time you can spend being creative, right? Um, if you're working within a limited box, you can only do so many things, you know what the parameters are, right? You know what the extremes are, uh, and you can more quickly work within that, and you can more quickly make decisions based on that, uh, which can lead you to places you may not expect, but it might be really cool, right? Because I can't duplicate this thing 20 times. I don't have this many voices, but maybe if I run it through a certain effect, and you know, play that an octave lower, it creates a cool harmony and that fills up a lot of space, right? That might be a decision based on limitations or it might be a decision based on you thinking about what would it be like if I only use this many tracks, 
What would it be like if I pretended like, uh, you know, Ableton Live only had, uh, you know, so many whatever, right? A lot of hardware um, is only going to have either so many tracks, so many effects that you can use. There's only so many samples you can play at a certain time, you know? Um, so sometimes, you know, like I said, making it kind of more of um, more of a game, um, you know, giving yourself kind of like an interesting challenge. Um, for me, anyway, it makes the process a lot more fun and more uh, gratifying, ultimately. Like, I want to have fun making something, you know? Um, so, yeah, so thinking about like, okay, what can I do with the least amount of resources? What can I do with the least amount of sounds? How many different ways can I process this one thing to turn it into five different elements, you know? Um, I don't have to do that based on like the limitations of my DAW, but considering the limitations I've had in the past, uh, sometimes it's fun to just bring that into this, you know, environment and see where that leads me. So, so to answer your question, do all of you need to know about that older gear? Uh, I don't think you have to, but I think if you're curious, it's good to just, you know, explore. I mean, it's, it's not wasted knowledge at all, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, not all of your favorite songs are made strictly within a DAW, you know? So um, awareness is key. And the more aware you are, you know, your your curiosity might naturally lead you to want to know more about this older hardware. So if you're curious, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. Can you say uh, the, that album you talked about, the first one uh, with lots of colors, the vinyl one? Oh yes, uh, it's called The Adventures of Astro Pirates. And it's by an artist named Lenny White. Um, that album, yeah, The Adventures of Astro Pirates by Lenny White. And if you can find it on vinyl, that's what I'd recommend. Um, just yeah. because, you know, the, the main thing, or if you can just find the full artwork, uh, then you'll kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, it's that record and the Jean-Luc Ponty record, Cosmic Messenger. Um, again, I was like five, and my mom would sit in uh, the dining room area. She had a rocking chair. And we had this little like hi-fi stereo system. And on the weekends, you know, she would just kick it in a rocking chair and she'd play these records and it's vinyl. So I would see the record covers, you know, and it just made a really big impression on me. The artwork, the physical tactile nature of the record um, and obviously the music, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah. A lot of what I'm talking about, you could trace back to those two albums, quite honestly. So um, definitely going to check this out. Awesome. No, this is great. This is great. And I, and I really appreciate you just, um, you know, yeah, utilizing this time to, to have a dialogue and to ask questions. I mean, that's that's what this is about, you know. So. And I will also say, too, uh, I try to tell everybody this when I do workshops and whatnot, because I feel it's really important, <laughs> especially based on whatever reputation I may have. Um, I have learned through experience. Um, I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. Uh, I learn a lot through my interactions with different people, through classes, through workshops, through whatever it is, right? So um, I say that just to say that I value these sort of exchanges uh, and also that it's important to just stay open, you know, throughout the entire creative process because you never know what you're going to learn or what thing is going to like, you know, spark that light bulb that, uh, you know, leads you down that fruitful path. So, but yeah, uh, any other questions or comments or anything? Going once, going twice. Yeah, Tavis, there's one from Brown Wynn. Ah, yes. Yep. Do I see? Okay, I have the chat and this thing open as well. So let me see. Uh, during a production process, how do you pick what elements and sounds to add next? Is there a structured thought process or are all your decisions based off of feeling? Uh, this is an excellent question. So for me, there's usually two or three different directions that I'll start, which will de determine where I'm going to go. Um, Typically, I like to start with some sort of drums or something rhythmic, you know. Um, so it may be starting off with like, you know, maybe taking uh, a drum break or something and chopping it up so I can use that like a kit. It might start off with like me recording myself doing some beatboxing or like, you know, playing with jingling my keys and trying to make that rhythmic. But I usually like to have a rhythmic framework to start with. Um, and then at that point, it's like, okay, what's the next thing that I think will complement this the best? Um, it might be a baseline. Uh, if there's a melody that I've had in my head, you know, I, I'll probably need something rhythmic as a framework for that melody first, and then I'll add that melodic thing next, right? And then ultimately, I'm just thinking about, okay, what frequency ranges are going to complement what I've just added? So if I add a baseline, then I'm thinking about, okay, what's going to sit on top of this, right? 
uh, whether it's a melodic thing or something that's going to sit in the mid range that's more like a pad type sound or some chords. Um, at that point, I'm thinking about complementary frequency ranges, right? Um, with this track, that's kind of a good example. Like uh, when it came to the drums, um, initially I had the kick, I had the clap, and I had the hi hat. And I was like, all right, I don't like the sound of the kick, so I need to do something to fill in the space. I recorded a separate kick and snare, and that worked pretty well. And then I was like, okay, I need something to sit on top of this to complement the frequency ranges where the kick and the snare are at. So I need something that sits way on top. And that's where the percussive layers came from. And since there's so much space between the kick and the snare, there's more room for those percussive layers to occupy more space in between those hits. You know, um, with the melodic stuff, it's kind of the same thing. You know, uh, the first melodic thing that I had was that initial stem that was kind of more in the mid range. And then I was like, all right, I want a brighter, higher melody. So I focused on something that was a couple octaves higher. And that's where that second layer came in. After that, I was like, all right, I've got drums and I've got melody, but there's no sub bass. And I didn't actually point that out, but I guess I'll just show real fast. Where is it at? I got all the Zoom stuff on my screen. Here it is. Uh, I ended up adding this bass layer after everything else. It's really simple. It's just a sine wave with some saturation. Um, but that came afterwards because I realized I was lacking something in that frequency range. So once I get the initial idea down, I'm really thinking about filling in the frequency ranges uh, with complementary sounds. So. Um, but ultimately it is based off of feeling really, <laughs> uh, I can, I can like articulate the process, but I'm not thinking consciously through it that much when I'm doing my own thing, right? If I'm teaching people, then I can talk through every single step, but honestly, if I'm just doing my own thing, my own projects are not neatly organized because I'm just creating, I'm just throwing stuff at the wall as it comes through, you know? Uh, after I have a bunch of ideas that I like, I'll step back, revisit the project, and then when I'm in a different headspace, then I can edit, uh, then I can be a bit more critical about those ideas, you know. Um, but yeah, when I'm creating, it's really all feeling, you know, and then after that, I can scrutinize. That That's my personal process, so. Um, any other questions? Let me make sure I'm not missing anything else. Uh, okay, cool. Any other questions before we wrap up today? I guess I can stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Davius, for being here. Oh, no uh, worries. Thank oh, you. Awesome. And um, my colleague Harrison did share some links in the chat. So if you guys haven't had a chance to look at those, feel free to do that. And yeah, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at more events. And thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank everybody for coming, for your time and attention. And uh, yeah, hopefully this will... Uh, keep fueling, helping to fuel your inspiration and, uh, you know, add some momentum to your creative process. So once again, thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.